Okay, good morning, Rabotai, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday morning, Erev Shabbat Kodesh, as we are here in the weeks between Pesach and Shavuot, and we are studying uh, part, Perasha, part Pirkei Avot. Today's class will be on Pirkei Avot. And we are in chapter 1, Mishnah 1. Uh, here we go. So we spoke in prior classes about what the uh, the opening sentence and Perek Avot as a whole, but here we go. Moshe Kibel Torah Mi Sinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai. Mesara le Yehoshua. He gave it over to Yehoshua. Yehoshua le Zekenim. He gave it over to the Zekenim, to the elders. Uzkenim le Nevi'im. The elders gave it to the prophets. Unvi'im mesaruha le Anche Keneset Hagedola. And the prophets then gave it over to the members of the great assembly. And there's a few things to note over here. First of all, the verbs. The verbs keep changing. Moshe Kibel, whereas Moshe, it says, received the Torah. And then it says, Mesara, he handed it to Joshua. It doesn't say that Joshua received it from Moshe. Why does it, why does it seem to be incons inconsistent in the verbiage? Moshe Kibel, Moshe received the Torah, and then he gave it to Yoshua. It should have stayed consistent. Mishnayot, you, sh you should know, were originally never written down. Right, which is part of the tragedy is that Abu Danasi had to eventually write Mishnayot. It wasn't a good thing, okay? But he had to. It was what we call the lesser of two evils. But originally, Rabbi Danasi wanted to, the Torah meant for the Torah Shabbat Pet to remain oral. Teacher giving it to student, teaching it, it has more flexibility. Once it's written, it's uh, kind of written in stone and it's hard to change. There's zero flexibility, which is one of the problems that happened uh, once the Torah was written down, which is something that we, we know today. Once the, once the Gemara is written, a Rishon cannot argue on the Gemara, right? It used to be that if a Bet Din arises that's greater than a prior Bet Din, they can argue. That used to be the system. The Torah is able to be interpreted in many different ways. And each generation has to know what makes the most sense uh, what each leader has to know what makes the most sense for their generation. And sometimes this makes more sense, sometimes that makes more sense. So I'll give you an example. We're coming up to the holiday of Shavuot, where, uh, where we know how Ruth uh, eventually must perform a mitzvah called Yibum. Yibum, leveret marriage, is when the husband dies without kids. Those that are studying the daf right now, yevamot, okay, super difficult, right? And when a person dies without children, the, rel the brother of the deceased should marry the, the wife, the widow. And they'll have children and continue the name. And if you don't want to perform Yibum, then you do the, the other alternative, which is the spinning in the shoe. That's called Halitza. But either way, um, <clears throat> when, Ruth, when Ruth's husband dies and she becomes a widow, so now there's an opportunity here of Yibum. And we know eventually who does it, who marries her. What was his name? The hero of the story. Very good. Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth. But he says to Ruth, before I can marry you, there's somebody before me in line. And who is that? Well, we don't really know his name. He's called Ploni. He's like so-and-so, John Doe. Uh, some say his name was Tov. Okay, Toby. Whatever it is. But either way, this fellow, Ploni Almoni, he's approached by Boaz. And Boaz says to him, do you want to marry uh, Ruth? You get a nice field, you get a mitzvah. And he says, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm going to destroy my offspring. And the rabbis explain what he mean by that. So he meant the following. Ruth, we know, was a Moaviyah. She was from Moav. And the Torah, although allows conversions, the Torah restricts a conversion from the nation of Moav and the nation of Ammon. Two nations that cannot convert. Why? Not for today's class. But they're prohibited. If an Egyptian wants, we're allowed. If Amalek wants, we're allowed. Moab, Amon, not allowed. Okay? Now, says this fellow, I don't want to marry her because I'm afraid of my offspring in the future being um, Pasul. Being, you know, labeled as no good. And the question really is, it seems like this fellow... Ploni Almoni has his priorities all messed up. He's only worried about his great-grandkids. It sounds like he's not worried about himself doing a sin. Forget your grandkids. You, my friend, Ploni, are, are not, you're not allowed to marry her. So why are you only worried about your grandkids? Right? That's a good question. 
By the way, and, and, and what does Boaz hold? How does he marry her? Boaz, Boaz says to him, listen, we hold Amoni velo Amonit, Mu'avi velo Mu'avia. The restriction, the ban is only on the males. The women are allowed to convert. Ruth's a female. She's okay. And really, Plony Amoni says, and this is his whole argument, he says back to Boaz, you're right. Today she's allowed. What if in next generation the rabbis get up and ban it? What if the halakha changes because the Torah is flexible? And what if it changes in a hundred years? My grandkids will be asur. My grandkids will be restricted. I don't want to affect them. Me, I'm not worried about because today the halakha is what the Din says. But we know that a Din later on may get up and they may argue. So you see that before the Torah was written down, there was a lot of flexibility. But once the Rosh Hashanah is written and it's, it's recorded, that's it. We can no longer argue. It was, it was codified, it was canon, and that's it. This is the halakha, and we cannot, uh, we cannot change it. We cannot change halakha. So Moshe, let, let's go back. Moshe Kibel, Moshe gets the Torah from Sinai. And then he hands the tradition, the keys over to Yehoshua. And Yehoshua hands the keys over to the elders. And the elders hand it to the Nevi'im. We asked, why does it say Kibel by Moses? And by the by Yoshua it says Mesara. It doesn't say Kibel. Really, oh, this is going back to what we started with. The point of the point I'm trying to get to, Torah was always uh, oral until it was written. And being that that's the case, the rabbis of Yudanasi who wrote the Mishnah, who authored them, they were they tried to write Mishnayot in a way that was very easy to remember. Right? They would write Mishnayot, not always in a way that was so accurate as much as it was easy to remember. A lot of times, the Gemara says, you're right, it says it, but it meant that. Hasurim mehsera, there's missing words. Why does the Mishnah do that? Because he, he was focused on making sure you remember the, what flowed. The sentence had to flow so you could remember it by heart. The detail you'll for sure fill in. But the Mishnayot, so if you're writing a Mishnah, stay with the same verb. Moshe kibel Torah misinai. Yehoshua kibel mi Moshe. That's what I would do. Kibel, kibel, stay with the word kabal, kibel, received. But it changes. And there's many answers to this question. One answer we saw yesterday is that Moshe had to be proactive in receiving the Torah. He fought the angels. Whereas the rest of the students, Yehoshua was more passive. He was a student. He didn't really have to do anything to get it. Uh, of course, he had to, I'm not saying he, he had to work on his character and everything to be able to be a worthy student. But once he was a student, there was no fight. Unlike Moshe, who had to fight. So Moshe got it. Moshe Kibel. Okay? That's one answer that we saw uh, in yesterday's class. But there is another answer. And that is, we know that Moshe didn't get the whole Torah. Okay, he didn't. There's a lot of Torah that he didn't receive. Matter of fact, we know Moshe was only able to tap into 49 levels of wisdom. The 50th level was hidden from him. So Moshe Kibel, he got whatever he could as far as humanly capable. He didn't get it all. But when it comes to the next step, now how much? So Moshe only got 99%. But when he gave it to Yahushua, he gave 100% of what he had. So because the percentages of reception were different, so Moshe, by, the, by Moshe, the verb kibel is used because he only got 99%. Whereas opposed to the next step to Joshua, he gave 100% to Joshua. Okay, so that's another answer to, the, to this question of why the verbs are, keep changing. Now, who are the zekenim over here? Who are the elders exactly? It says he got it from from uh, Moshe, and then he gives it to the elders. Who are these elders? So it's a mahloket. It's a big mahloket. Okay, that's always the answer, right? I always told you guys, always the answer is mahloket. Okay, so it's a mahloket. Who does he give it to? These elders, who exactly are they? So some explain that the elders were everybody in between Yehoshua and the prophets. We know the era of prophets, starting with Eli HaKohen, okay, that was an era, Eli and then Shemuel HaNavi, right? So that era of prophets, up till there, 
everyone prior, in between Joshua and the prophet, that's all the Zekinim, that's all of the elders. That's one opinion, which by the way goes very nicely with the books of Tanakh that we have. We know that after the Chamisha Moshe Torah, after the Torah we have the next step. What's after the five books of Moshe? Yehoshua. And then what's after Yehoshua? What's the next book in Tanakh? Anyone know? Shoftim, Judges. And what's the next book? Shemuel, very good. Okay, so you see, look at this, the way even that the Tanakh books are written are like step after step. Moshe, that's the five books of the Torah. Yehoshua, that's the book of Yehoshua. Then the book of Shoftim, that's the Zekinim, that's the elders. And then the Nevi'im, which is the book of Samuel. So you see that each stage got its own book. It's very nice uh, to see it in such a clear manner like that. Others argue, others say, no, the Zekinim are not the elders, they are the Zekinim. Yes, the elders. But which elders? Not the judges in between the era of Joshua and, and the prophets. Rather, the Zekinim are the Zekinim that lived in the time of Yehoshua. People that lived in his time. And it's not talking about the era that stretched for hundreds of years. It's talking about the 70 elders that existed with him, that were alive in his time. Okay, so Yehoshua gives it over to these Zekerim. And again, each side, each opinion has questions and answers. We're not going to go into it right now. The Zekerim give it eventually to the Nevi'im, to the prophets. Nevi'im give it to the Anche Keneset Hagedola, which we, which we mentioned is the members of the Great Assembly, 120 rabbis. Mordechai was one of them. Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Ezra. 120 rabbis that were never replaced. That means once one died, they kept dying, dying, dying until you were left to the last one and then he died and then that was it, no more. They never restarted this group of 120 rabbis. It was a one-time thing. Uh, of Anshei, Keneset, the Gedolah, again, they wrote the Sidur, they wrote a lot of uh, Berachot for us, a lot of uh, fences they made. And who was the last, by the way, who was the last, last guy left from the 120? Who made it till the end? Shimon HaTzadik. Okay? Shimon HaTzadik. And, and remember him for later on when we get to Mishnah Bet. Okay? To the next Mishnah. Now, I want to just before, uh, I want to just read the next sentence with you together. I would like to read it and then come back and connect it to this first paragraph. Take a look. They said three things. Number one, hevu metunim badin. That means to be patient in court, in judgment. Be patient. Okay, we'll get back to each one. Number two, he'emidu talmidim arbe. Have many students. And number three, ve'asu siyag la Torah. Make fences for the Torah. Okay, so these are three pieces of advice. We asked in a class yesterday, why does the Mishnah begin with Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai? Why does it begin with this uh, link of tradition of a year? What does it have to do with Pirkei Avot? And we gave answers yesterday, beautiful answers, how really it's, it's really talking as a whole theme since Avot is ethics. And we have to know that ethics don't come from man. Ethics come from a divine source. We, we gave a nice answer to that. But there is one answer. That Rabbi Isaac Bernstein brings down. I forgot in, in the name of whom. But he says something very, very interesting. And that is... Oh, I think it is. One second. Okay, if the name comes, then I'll, then I'll let you know. But he says uh, something very interesting. Maybe it was Rabbi Heller. I don't know. I, I forget. But either way, he says, We know that Moshe, uh, the, the Torah in the time of Moshe, was very different from the era of Yehoshua, which was very different from the era of the Nevi'im. Okay, what do I mean by that? What, was, what type of Torah did we have in the time of Moshe? When Moshe was around, Moshe was alive, we had a period called Halakha Berura. What does that mean, Halakha Berura? It means it was clear Halakha, clear cut. There was zero doubt, zero questions. If you had a question, 
we, we, had, we have cases in the Chumash where they had a question. What did Moshe do when he had a question? What did Moshe do when he got a question that he didn't know? He said, wait, let me go ask God. Imdu veshmea. So as an example, when the daughters of Sedov Had came and said, we want to inherit our father's land. He doesn't have boys. Could we inherit? Moshe said, I don't know. Good question. Let me ask God. Right? When, uh, when the people came after Pesach, that couldn't celebrate Pesach, they said, we want to do it. What did Moshe say? Good question. Let me ask God. So it was an era of clarity that he was able to go and just ask Hashem directly. That was not how it was when Yehoshua was around. When Moshe died, Yeshua couldn't do such a thing. Yeshua was not able to just go and ask Hashem. Those days were gone. It says that Moshe was like the sun, Yeshua was like the moon. And that's the difference that existed. Just like the moon and sun are so, so far apart, right? In, in power and in capability. Moshe was a different level, than, right? Yeshua. So Yeshua couldn't do it. But we entered a new stage of Torah when Yoshua was around, and that is Torah Tapilpul. Right? That means the Torah of Pilpul is using Drash, the 13 different Midot, the 13 different uh, tools that we have to derive Halacha. Kalvahomer, uh, logic, or Gezerah Shava, where we have words that are similar, or Binyan Av, where we have a concept and we apply it to other similar ideas. Right? This is all under the Yud Gimel Midot. Matter of fact, we know that when Moshe died, thousands of halachot were forgotten. And how did they restore the halachot? They were restored through Pilpul, through these 13 attributes of learning of Drash, of deriving and squeezing out the halachas. So this was the second the, uh, era of Torah. So again, Moshe brought Torah in its perfect form, and he had a clarity. Whenever you had a question, you went to God himself. Nothing could be better. When Moshe dies, we enter a new stage with Yahushua and the elders. That was one stage together. That they were able to uh, squeeze and figure out Halakha using different, 13 different methods. And then we got to a final stage of uh, prophets. What was the Torah like in their era? What was it like when it came to the prophets? What did the prophets do? Prophets, prophets had a very interesting role. If you read the prophets, you find something that they did often, and that is that they were able to protect halacha. What do I mean by that? You find many times that a navi, uh, a navi would come along, and his job was to defend the Torah to defend halakha. And you even find sometimes that they even had to suspend the halakha as a one-time rule in order to preserve the halakha later on. Famous story, Eliyahu Navi. Remember Eliyahu Navi? Eliyahu Navi was the, um, he was during the time of King Ahav, where people were going to Abu Dazara, right and left. Judaism was not popular. And Eliyahu Navi says to the people, listen, you can't keep doing this. You come to Shul one day and then you go, to, to Abu Dazara the next. It's time to do once and for all. Let's do a test. Let's see who's legitimate. And he brings them. He brings them all to the Har Karmel. And he does a test. He tells them, listen, you take a cow and I'll take a cow. You bring an offering. I'll bring an offering. No fire. And let's see which God brings the fire down onto. And we'll, that will be the test. We'll know he's legitimate. And they were very confident. They were very. They couldn't say no, even though they were. They know. You know, the liars know they're liars, but they they couldn't say no. What are they gonna do? So they went. All the fake prophets. They go to the mountain. They built the mizbeach, and they secretly planted uh, a guy in there. They put a guy with a match, you know, lighter, and they told him, <clears throat> "When we call out, light it from inside." And it'll be appearing as if it's coming from the heavens. Okay? Good idea. Well, they go, they build the Mizbeach. And they start calling out uh, to their God. And uh, the, guy, the guy didn't light it up. Because God sent a snake to kill him. 
So the guy, he's not doing anything, and they start yelling, uh, <laughs> you know, they're trying to give him the signal, maybe he forgot the signal. Either way, it looked like, uh, they, they, made, they looked like fools at the end of the whole uh, scene. They're screaming and crying. Finally, Eliyahu Navi says to them, you know, maybe your God is, uh, is sleeping, maybe scream louder, wake him up. You know, maybe, um, maybe he went away, maybe his fight was delayed, you know what I mean? Maybe he tried something else. Nothing helped, nothing helped, until Eliyahu Navi came, what did he do? He said, Aneni Hashem Aneni, God, please answer me. And what happened? A fire came down. And when the Jews saw this, they all started screaming in one, Amonai Hua Elohim, Amonai Hua Elohim. God is one, God is the, Hashem is the God, right? Hashem is God, Hashem is Hashem is God. And this is a line that we say in the High Holidays. It comes from this episode in the Nevi'im, in the Prophets, right? It was a moment. Now the king at the time didn't like this. He didn't take well to what happened. Uh, Eliyahu Navi, believe it or not, was forced to run away again after this. Okay, and then when he went to Har Sinai. So again, if you don't want to believe in Hashem, you're never going to believe. You could have a prophet and a miracle and a fire. Nothing's going to change your mind. Anyways, that's what happens. So you see the Gemara asks, how did Eliyahu Navi do this? You're not allowed to bring a korban outside of the Beit HaMikdash. It's a sin. It's forbidden. You have to bring it only in the temple. Beit HaMikdash. What are they doing it outside? And the Gemara says he had to preserve the Torah so that Navi has the right to suspend one time. Not forever, but one time he's allowed to suspend halakha. So each one of these has a different role. Again, Moshe Rabbeinu's role was to bring them the Torah in its purest form. Yehoshua's role was to try to figure out the halakha through 13 methods. And then the prophet's role was to protect the halakha. And if that's the case, look my friends at the three pieces of advice. And you see something over here remarkable. The three pieces of advice. Hevu metunim badin. Number one means to be patient. Number two, he'emidu talmidim arbe. Have many students. And number three, have a siag la Torah to put a fence. And if you pay attention, he says, each method is really there as a replacement of the era uh, of, each, of each of those three eras. The first era, the era of Moshe, that bringing Torah in its most pure state, again, that is not possible today. We don't have that option. And as a replacement of that, we had, he teaches us, hevu metunim badim, be very patient. When you're judging and, de and be deliberate because you can't go and ask. So you have to think about it well. Think, f think well about each halakha. That is the first uh, step. The second replacement of Yehoshua's method. Yehoshua was the one again who restored halakha through the different ways of drash. And for that you need many students. The more students. Matter of fact, we know that the whole Tosafot, Tosafot, one of the main Commentaries on the Talmud. You know how Tosafot was written? There was a big rabbi at the time. Rashi's grandson, actually. The Ri. If I'm not mistaken. And he had many students. And they would learn. And each student, he had his Gemara by heart. He knew it well. So as an example, you could going to learn Masechet Sukkah well. I want you to know Berachot. I want you to know Kiddushin. I want you to know Zevahim, each one. He had 36 students that knew each Masechet, their own Masechet, called. And when they would sit and learn together, they would learn, let's say they would open up this Gemara, they would start learning, and then all of a sudden, the guy who was learning Masechet Kiddushin would say, wait one second, my Gemara says this. So how come it says this over here? And they would have an answer. And then another one would say, yeah, but mine says that. Boom, 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 boom. And that's how Tosafot came to be written. Okay? So through the many students is a replacement of Yehoshua's era. And finally, the Nevi'im, who again were there to protect the Torah. That's beautifully the third piece of advice. Asu siyag la Torah. Make a fence for the Torah. Okay? As again, as a protection. Let's go just quickly uh, before we end today's class. Each one, each one. Uh, of these ideas. And again, there's a lot to talk about. It says again, to be patient. In life, we have to be, to wait. Okay? 
Don't jump to conclusions. We love jumping to conclusions. We like when we see something, we want to know right away what happened. We want to know, always ask me someone right, someone wrong, what's going to happen, right? That's why suspense, the suspense in movies, right? Cliffhangers, TV series, they, they leave you at the end of the show with a cliffhanger so you want to come watch the next one because we hate not knowing things. We hate not knowing the answer, right? So we always like, because of that, that's the case, we like jumping to conclusions. We like to assume. If we see someone, oh, they're wrong, they're right. Now, the Mishnah is talking to, first of all, it's talking to the court and it's saying to the court, you have to be very careful don't, don't judge right away because you see what happens sometimes when people in life judge right away, especially when it's in cases of, uh, uh, of court and capital punishment and with governments. Okay, sometimes we had just recently somebody who was in jail for many, many years and then they realized that the whole thing was a mistake, right? So how do you make that up to the guy? You just threw his life away. You put him in jail, falsely accused. So don't jump to conclusions. Be deliberate, think about it, discuss it, chew it again and again and again. And uh, again, for a bad deed also to retract, loses the, they lose their reliability. If you make a mistake, then you say, oh, uh, we made a mistake. You lose your credence. That's why a lot of times it takes a lot of courage to be able to admit I made a mistake. And rarely will you have this today, unfortunately, in politics. Well, they'll say... We were wrong. They'll never say we were wrong. They'll say, oh, the, the evidence changed, the facts changed, right? We don't like admitting we were wrong because it causes people to lose reliability in us, right? And you, and you see really the greatness of scholars in their responses when they when they undo a, 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 a response that they once gave and they say, you know, I, although I said this, I'm rethinking and I think I made a mistake. It takes a lot of humility to be able to do that. If I could tell you actually something a little bit uh, shocking, okay? So listen to this one. We know that there's a halakha called Ed Zomim. So that tells us that when you have somebody that comes to court, let's say, let's say, okay, let's say two witnesses come into court and they say that A killed B, okay? So what do we do? We kill A. Now, two other witnesses come and say that the first two witnesses were with them in Honolulu. So how'd you see him kill B? If you, were, you weren't there. You were all the way in Hawaii. So what do we do now? That's called Ed Zomim. These two first witnesses are not only liars, but they're proved to be liars through a testimony of Imanu Hayitem. You were with us. When that's the case, Talacha says, lo zamam. You do to them what they wanted to do to A. They wanted to get A killed. The Torah says you kill A and you kill the two witnesses. Okay? Now there's a very interesting halakha. And the halakha says that this is only true if the person that they were trying to kill, A, wasn't killed yet. But Hargu, if the Beitin went ahead with the testimony and they accepted A and B and then they killed him, they killed A, then, then two witnesses come and prove the first two witnesses wrong. The Torah says, you don't do anything. You don't accept the second pair of witnesses. And that is, that is partly because, if you imagine what would happen if you now go ahead and accept the second pair of witnesses, and then you kill the first pair of witnesses, how much doubt is that going to throw into the minds of people? Wow, you killed someone... At the end of the day, because you already killed him, there's nothing to do. If you didn't kill him yet, so of course, you accept the f second witnesses. But here they already killed him, so we don't want to accept because it would throw doubt and it would destroy the reliability of the entire system. Okay, it's a very interesting uh, halakha, but that is why it's so important to make sure in the beginning to think, not to accept right away. There was actually... There was actually a, uh, a rabbi in the Gemara who they tried to falsely accuse his son that his son was uh, guilty of something and the court accepted the testimony and as the guy is being taken out to be killed 
innocently. The two witnesses felt bad and they said, you know what, we admit we were lying. And the halakha is that we don't accept the testimony. Once you said it, we can't re-accept a, a change in your policy or in your testimony. And they went out and they killed this rabbi's son. Uh, not, not correctly so. Okay, so very tragic when people jump to conclusions how many times a relationship can be ended. And a lot of times you see a guy going out with a girl and one side decides to break it up with the other. Why? What happened? I heard. And again, it's all rumors. and It's not true. A person has to be so, so careful not to base decisions in life uh, on, on, just, on just things that we hear from behind the grapevine. We have to actually do research and research well. And of course, this is talking to us not only as judges, even as individuals. In our own lives, we have to be so careful, again, not to judge people and not to jump to conclusions about individuals. Okay, don't be superficial. That's, that's the first idea. Um, next sentence, and maybe we'll stop after this. Okay, what does that mean? On a simple level means, have many students. Okay, so what does that mean, have many students? It means have many students. Okay, in life, in life, right, we, we have to remember that um, we'll never know, we'll never know really which, uh, where success is going to come from. You know what I mean? A lot of times you can have a person that will invest into one stock, but you never know, maybe the other stocks can do well, right? They always say to have a basket and widen your portfolio and have different options because you never know where success, which avenue, right? You should always have a lot of friends. You never know which one you may need one day, right? Don't limit yourself to a small denomination or to a small number, right? So a person may have a student and he's a prodigy. And this guy is great. And then he ends up being a bust. So you invested everything into this one kid and then you have no legacy. Have many students. Even though those other students maybe will not, uh, will not become a uh, chief rabbi one day. Right? They may not be ones that are going to take over your business. They may not be the next uh, Bill Gates or Elon Musk. Right? It doesn't matter. Have many students. You never know actually which one's going to become great. Which one's going to have that great, brilliant idea that's going to take your company to the next level. Right? In life, it's always good to diversify, to have many options, to, to have many students in, in the sense that uh, don't put all your, basket, all your eggs in one basket, okay? So this is on a simple level, it's great advice. It's great advice. If a person is going to, matter of fact, you know the Gemara Masechet Berachot, the Gemara tells us that Rabban Gamliel used to have a policy that he only allowed into the Beit Midrash, the cream of the crop students. Only if you were legitimate. If you were here to clown around, you just came for the for the food don't come we don't want you here okay and then when he got replaced by Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah had a different policy and he said he said um, you know we accept everybody you're a top student you're an honor student you're a you're a, a you know a C class student whatever it is that you are you're welcome into the class he opened the Beit Midrash. Everybody was welcome. The real question is, the real question is, how did Rabban Gamliel argue on that? How is he allowed to have policy going against our Mishnah? If our Mishnah says, have many students, how was he allowed to be very selective? Okay, this is the Hida's question. I want you to think about this question over Shabbat. Okay? But let's, uh, let's just go on one, for one moment to maybe a deeper answer of this question, uh, idea of this statement. Ha'amidu doesn't say, tel, talmidim arbe. It doesn't say, ha, uh, teach many students. You know what it says? It says, to stand up many students. The word le'ha'amid, the rabbis notice it, and therefore the rabbis conclude that the Mishnah may be trying to teach us something to deeper. You know, the, the Gemara tells us, Sheker en lo raglayim. Feet, uh, 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 false, have no feet. You ever heard of that line? Sheker, meaning the truth prevails. Right? The truth always comes out at the end. 
a liar doesn't have what to stand on. Maybe, right? If you take, if you take something like something pointy, you may be able to stand it for a split second, right? And you let go. It could stand for a second or two or ten, but eventually it's gonna fall. It can't last. So people that lie, they could lie for a week, for a month, for a few years. Maybe they could get away with it, but eventually the truth catches up. Sheker, if you look at the words sheker, the shin, kuf, and resh are all very fragile letters. They have no base to stand on. Okay, emet, aleph, two legs strong. The mem, flat on the bottom, strong. The taf, two legs, again, strong. So truth, you can't argue, right? When the best, the best, uh, best answer is the truth. You give truth, you can't argue on the truth. Truth is truth. Sheker will come out at the end. The liars, and we wonder sometimes in life, it's not fair, we see liars getting away with it. The people that cheat and steal, and they get all the honor, and they're up there. Don't worry. The truth will come out one day. And justice will be served. So the word stand is associated with truth. And what that means in our context, our rabbis are telling us, Something very deep. And that is, says the Tosfot Yom Tov, make sure that when you teach your students, when you're giving them information, Ha'amidu, make sure that you put it in their minds in a way that will last. Make sure that it stands in their hearts in a way that's truthful. A lot of times we teach and then our kids have a question. Why? Could you explain it? And we don't have the answer. And instead of looking it up, or instead of taking the five minutes to, to explain it to them, we get all flustered and we, uh, don't, don't ask questions. Uh, I said, you have to listen to me, right? This is unfortunate. Even today in many schools, you'll find that the teachers are only there to give information. But that's not the goal of, again, going back to something that we spoke about yesterday. That's not the goal of a school. A school is not there just to give information. The school is, the goal is leha amid. You have to be able to stand students forever. That will be there from beginning to end. Sheker doesn't stand. Leha amid, like emet, like truth. What happens after the kid leaves yeshiva? Does he still want to go pray? Does he still want to go learn? Is he still happy? Did he create positive memories and experiences? If the, if the kid's just going to pray, right? And this is such an important lesson as parents. We don't want our kids to listen. That's not what we want. We don't want our kids to obey. If I, I told you to go to shul, so fine, he goes to shul. That's not what we want, right? We want them to go pray even when they leave the home. Even when they move out. We want them to be to study Torah. We want them to do chesed even when they're not under the supervision of the parents. That's really what a parent wants. And again, sometimes... We forget that, so we, we invest so much into making sure they listen, but the goal is to educate, right? And that is, to stand them up in a way that they will be proud of what they have. If we could just open to a quick Rashi, go back to Perashat, Lech Lecha, I believe. Okay, if I'm not mistaken. Remember when Lot and Abraham separate? Yes? They separate because they had too much money. And it says that after Lot leaves, he goes to which city? Anyone know? He goes to the city of Sedom. Okay, Sedom the Amora. And then there was a big battle and Lot was caught up over there. And then a guy comes and says to Abraham, by Abu Apalit, the fugitive comes and says to Abraham, your nephew Lot is in, is in war, he's a prisoner of war, you have to go get him out. So it says over here in the, in the chapter, after the battle, it says that Abraham finds out, chapter 14, Pasuk 14, Vayishma Avram kinishba Ahiv, Avram hears that his brother was taken captive. Vayarek et Hanichav, he arms his disciples. He arms his men that were there with him, 318, and they chase the four kings and their, and, and their uh, armies 
They chase them out and they rescue Lot. Okay? What is this word Hanichav? Hanichav, we know that that word is, by the way. You know it. Hinuch. The word Hinuch. What do we use that? We translate it loosely as to, to teach our children, right? Hinuch. And uh, Hanukata Bait. The same word. What does that word Hanichav mean? Look at Rashi. Rashi says, What is Hanichav? Next page. Vehu Lashon. This is the language of Hathalat Knisat Adam. When you're entering a person, Okeli, or an item, Le'umanut Shehu Atid La'amod Bo. Into a trade or into something that they're going to be in forever. When we have a Hanukkah Tabait, we're hoping that this house will be something that will be permanent. The ideas, the warmth, the temperature, the energy in the house. When you're raising a kid, the goal is not to just raise him for today. It has to be that you are raising him into something shehu atid la'amod bo. That he is going to, in the future, when you're not looking, that's real education. Yosef HaTzadik leaves his father's house. He goes down to Egypt. And what does he see when he's about to sin with Potiphar's wife? He remembers his father. He remembers the love. He remembers the warmth. And he stays connected to his religion. So what are we doing to instill, again, positive experiences? If the goal is just that they should leave honor students, that they should leave top of the class, that they should leave, and through our system they did everything well, but we gave them zero incentive to want to continue, we have failed as educators. The goal of education is not to teach and it's not to create students or followers, but a true leader creates other leaders. So our goal is leha amin, to create in our talmidim and our children future people that will continue in that path uh, forever and ever. Okay, I think we'll stop over here. Uh, beautiful ideas. Uh, and we should be always to create lasting impressions on those that we are around. Have a Shabbat Shalom, and God willing, we will see you all uh, next week. Bye-bye.